Okay, so those of you who joined us uh, in the last few minutes, um, my name's Peter, I'll be the host for most of the day. Uh, this is the dev room for Internet of Things. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for the team for organizing this, helping with everything. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Jan Nodby from Norway, who will talk about this and show this. And we will have 25 minutes for every session. Um, questions as part of that. And if you have stuff you want to talk about, think about much later. This, eve this afternoon we have an open session, two hours, where we can talk about different things. So I'd like to uh, give Jan, since you're the first speaker, extra two minutes, and we can start. Thank you very much. Everyone, a big hand of applause for Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Good morning. So I'm going to try to do a demo a bit later, but let's just start with the introductions first. My name is Jon Nurby. I'm from Norway, as I said. And I'm here to talk about flow-based programming in heterogeneous um, systems, or four heterogeneous systems. And if I'm lucky, yeah. so um, first I'll introduce flow-based programming. Does anyone have a concept, an idea what flow-based programming is? Have you heard about it before? There are a few hands, but not many. So flow-based programming is a data flow oriented way of programming, where the key um, things you have are components, which are um, isolated uh, pieces of functionality, uh, perhaps stateless, perhaps not, uh, that you connect with other components through ports. So it can look something like this. This is uh, NoFlow Jekyll, which is a port of um, Jekyll uh, to uh, flow-based programming environment. And uh, this is running then on uh, Node.js, JavaScript. Important thing to note with flow-based programming, at least the NoFlow and MicroFlow implementations is that there is no code generation. This is not something that you put in something and you get out something else and you have to maintain that something else and no way of going back and forth. It is a proper runtime, even on the microcontroller. So you can introspect it, uh, there is um, APIs for it, and you can do uh, interesting stuff. So uh, another thing. It, Flow-based programming is not necessarily visual programming. It lends itself very nicely to visual programming, but uh, you can program it in other ways. This is a, uh, a FPP or .FPP, which is a, a domain-specific language, which uh, basically describes the, the components. Um, yeah, so uh, this describes the the graph of uh, nodes and connections uh, using domain-specific language, which is quite, quite natural, uh, fairly humanly readable. Um, there are two key things here. The first you see in the corner where you have uh, an instance name and a component name. That's the instantiation of a, of a node. And then the um, out-trigger, uh, that is a connection. And those are the two fundamental things. There's also literals, uh, so-called IIPs, which are static data. And uh, that data is not very different from a connection. It's just that it doesn't change. Um, you can, for any of those, also connect real data and it changes. Uh, both uh, MicroFlow and NoFlow have embedding APIs. So you can use it for part of your program, if you so choose. Uh, maybe have something that you feel is very, would fit data flow very well. The other stuff you don't think is necessarily so, you can embed one of those and, and, and use them. So uh, what is the combination? Why? So nowadays, we have a lot of different computing systems. And in maybe especially in the Internet of Things, we have different types of uh, computing systems that we want to integrate together. So the case here is very trivial. Um, it's just a, a heating system which uh, you have a UI for and it has a server for doing logging and potentially analysis and so on. And there's a microcontroller actually controlling a, a, heating, a heating element. And typically you would program the user interface. If it's native, you would do like Objective-C plus Java plus uh, C Sharp or something maybe three different technologies already there. 
and uh, or you could use JavaScript and HTML, which might give you uh, cross-platform solutions for the UI bits. Um, on the server side, people use things like Python, Lua, Ruby, which has different. There are different languages. There are different tools. You different IDs, and some of the ways of thinking are different as well. And on the microcontroller, it's even more different. You typically use C or C++. You don't really have the opportunity to use JavaScript or or so on, and probably never will on a really small microcontroller. So how can we bridge um, these things together? If you want to have a small development team, maybe you're just one person. I mean, maybe it's just you. Uh, you don't want to learn that, that, and that, and then also take care of all the um, different constraints. I mean, you want the fluent UI, which is very nice and smooth and looks pretty. On the other hand, you want to secure um, service systems, and you want uh, maybe real-time sensitive stuff on a microcontroller. So uh, the idea here is to use flow-based programming as a, a fairly universal metaphor, because the components can be backed by anything. In the case of Microflow, which runs on the Arduinos here, the components are C++. In the case of uh, stuff you're running in the UI, the components are JavaScript, HTML, standard DOM, manipulation stuff. But there is a common way of accessing them. Yeah. So I think I'll just jump into the demo and hope that things are still running. So just uh, the UI in this case is. Oh, what did I do? Might have broken the demo already. Anyway, um, I have a piece of UI which just shows the temperature of my heating system. That's just the most trivial bit that you would ever uh, have. So let me try to heat the thing. It's, it's sensing. Hopefully it has changed. Yes. If I hit it a bit more. Well, then the heater turned off because, well, Apparently, 28 degrees is a good indoors temperature. You don't need to heat more than that. Um, so uh, this is then a combination of a web UI. And then there is a, uh, I can show a terminal. Put a minimal. Beauty. So let me just pop up. Um, so the the server in this case only does uh, logging. So, uh, but the server could, uh, which is on my computer in this case, uh, but would maybe more be on a router or a Raspberry Pi or something in a in a more uh, realistic setup. Um, that's something that I mean it, it can do the things that a microcontroller cannot. A microcontroller can easily control the heating elements and so on. But for instance, if you want to do uh, data analysis of the stuff that you've collected, you might want to have a server. If you just want to store the stuff, you might want to have a server as well. So the server, I'll just show you. So it's just um, uh, putting out a log of, of all those data. So it's just really trivial just to have all the pieces involved that you might want to have in a, in a more realistic case. So now for the software, where things get interesting, put away the magic. And uh, OK, so the UI software, there we go. So this is um, what makes the UI. This is a flow-based programming of this trivial thing that you saw that just lists the temperature. So it communicates to the server via WebSocket. So I'm just um, specifying the URL to connect to. I connect, and I listen for messages. I don't really do anything with the send message because I just respond to the temperature changes. 
On the temperature change, I'd use a uh, selector for getting the DOM element, which I want to manipulate. And I just write that. So that is how the value is updated. So this is the, the UI. And here you can do crazy stuff. The IDE that you see is written using the same uh, tools and the same framework. So you can do quite a things. This is the server. And uh, there's a bug, so there is no icons. But um, So this one has a WebSocket uh, server uh, configured here. So you see this is the port that matches what I have on the client side. And um, it just listens for connections. These are for requests. We don't do anything with HTTP requests, so we just drop them on the floor. Um, the connections, we again uh, listen to messages to, and this is just for debug. Um, we, the same connection, so it, the client connects, I get that in here, and then I pass that to send message so that I can send the message back using the same connection. And um, here is, go. The five things, so the ones you see, see up here? Yeah, those are, they're part of the same functionality. So they, together, they form the handling of WebSocket communication. So um, the server acts as the actual server, but it gets the configuration from Kick, which just starts the whole thing and sends its configuration on. And then the server uh, will give you connections. When one client comes on, you get one connection. That goes on to, um, to listen to messages. I have construct. I would construct a web server using them. Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, are these five um, uh, pieces uh, like uh, are they a web server already, or have I made a web server with these things? If I understand the question correctly. So this they handle separate parts of the same problem. For instance, if I wanted to do to handle different clients differently, I would need to do something else than just pass all the connections on. I might want to say, okay, if you're on this host or that host, then I'll do something different with that connection object that gets passed along. Uh, in this case, I'm just treating everything the same. That's why it looks very, uh, it looks a bit redundant because there's it's just a straight line. Um, the other part here is communication with a microcontroller. And this is where things get a bit more interesting. Uh, this component allows me to take a graph, which is a description of the program that's running on the microcontroller. This is what's running on the microcontroller. Um, I can put that in here so that the server actually programs the microcontroller as it should be. In this case, just be a thermostat. And um, then it will give me its output here. So that's how I'm retrieving the temperature data from the microcontroller. And that is then, it's uh, sent to the UI through WebSocket, uh, just dumping it to, uh, to the terminal. And I'm appending it to the file. So that's the log. So the last piece is what's actually running on the microcontroller. And it's same principles again. This is maybe a simpler program to explain because it's very simple logically. I have a timer component which fires a message every every whatever it's set to, in this case, 1,000 milliseconds, one second. And uh, when that happens, or when that sends a message on, the, uh, that triggers the next component. It reads the temperature from this digital uh, temperature sensor. It goes through a hysteresis latch so that I can have a different threshold for when to activate the cooler than to drop it so that if the temperature fluctuates around something, then it won't go on, off, on, off, on, off like crazy. And um, because I wanted the output to be uh, on when it's uh, too cold, and I had to put an invert boolean in there. And then I just write that status to the output, which is, in this case, the LED. That would normally be the relay for, for the output. So um, how am I doing on time? 
Okay, so I'll just show a brief thing. So um, this is the program I'm on my controller. Did you see the values change? This is me observing the, the values of the data that's going through the program inside the microcontroller. So there's a runtime so I can introspect it. I can say, okay, what are the values of this connection between the temperature and the latch? So if I want to know if, if it's working correctly or not. And these down here are the outputs that are here. So I can determine, okay, is this... Uh, uh, this uh, hysteresis is working correctly or not, and I can introspect this visually, which is quite, quite a powerful tool. How can you make back to? Um, send the data from the web server to the client side. Ah, um, that is... So... This component here, that represents the microcontroller program in the server. Yeah, so the question is um, if the Arduino writes in a certain output port. Right now, there's a hack. <laughs> um, this, I, 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 I knew the program and I'm using the introspection facilities that I showed before to retrieve the value. Um, it will work differently uh, quite soon. Yes, so what I did... Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is possible to do. Um, sorry, the question was um, the digital write, for instance, um, how it, it has an input and it's has a side effect of being actually uh, triggering the LED, and then it passes its output on. In, in this case, in the server, I'm hooking into this value, right? The temperature value. Um, so this will work slightly differently soon. This is just for the demo. I'll talk about that now. Um, so, this is a, this is very much a proof of concept right now. It's very rough. It's, I'm glad it worked uh, at all. Um, this concept of combining stuff that's running in the browser, on a server, on a microcontroller, and then thinking about systems that include all of them together, is uh, very much in the in this in the early stages for for flow-based programming and, and microflow and noflow. So, what we want to do now is to finish the microflow component. So there was a way of um, getting a microflow program that's running here and represented on the server. Uh, that should be done automatically. Right now, as I said, there was a hack. Um, and then we will allow you to expose ports, and that will be a UI feature. So when you have this, 
when you have this program, you should be able to say, okay, uh, I'll, I'll draw a box around all of them, and I want to expose, yeah, for instance, that temperature out to the outside world, and, well, maybe the, the output here, just to be able to, to uh, verify it from a server side. Um, and um, the, the components should automatically reflect the changes that you make in the program that the, that component uh, represents. That's currently not handled at all. Uh, it's very static. And this um, component that I have here, this, when I blow that up, I get that. I should just be able to double click and go there. Right now, you see there, there are different tabs in my IDE. They're actually different. They're actually different IDs. <laughs> this is the same ID, but different instances. Uh, that should be more integrated. Henry has made a public promise that this will work next week. <laughs> um, so, and we also want to do the same kind of stuff for uh, the bridging between servers and the client side. So now I did all this uh, WebSocket handling myself, the filling and stuff. I didn't have to care that this was serial over USB to the microcontroller. It should be the same between the client and the and the and the server. So I'll just be able to say, okay, I have a server. It's, uh, I'm communicating with it somehow. Um, it has this program. This program has certain inputs and certain outputs, and I just want to be able to hook into those. Um, that's a vision for that. And uh, and here, this is very much a hierarchical hierarchical system. The UI is on top, and there's a server, and then there's a microcontroller. And uh, but we want to also think about having, for instance, a Python runtime, JavaScript runtime, running on the same machine and co collaborating as peers. Uh, that that they're more equals and not just one is a slave over the other. And that also ties in with specialized domains, for instance, audio, video processing, and so on. And we want to do some proper case studies, not just silly demos. So that's what I have. I'm open for questions. And there will be stickers for those who give. Yeah, go. That's our you. Let's get that. How do you deal with very slowly or non-responding sensors to have a timeout value which you can catch and then retry or do whatever so right now there's no watchdog functionality or anything like that but it's definitely a natural thing to bake in the framework you have a server which knows it's communicating with a microcontroller and it has even the knowledge of the software it's supposed to run on there it should verify that yeah it's responding as it should and if not it should kill it and restart it or whatever is serious fallback Questions? Uh, could you tell me the footprint of the uh, current prototype on the microcontroller? So uh, the current microcontroller here is uh, Arduino Nano, which is uh, Atmel Atmega328, the most common one. Um, it's running with uh, uh, 500 by bytes of uh, SRAM and something like um, 16K of uh, program memory for the standard image. Uh, it can run on uh, uh, AT Tiny, which has a total of 700 uh, bytes of SRAM or something like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty low. Questions? Is there a certain protocol you are using to talk to your Arduino, or um, is it just low-level? You are reading just the serial data and transform it. So the communication with the Arduino here is uh, serial over USB, uh, but the protocol that I have on it is uh, like on a separate level. So I consider just this to be just one transport. For instance, I also have a uh, simulator a runtime that runs that can run microcontroller programs on my computer. And there, I just have a transport which is just between JavaScript objects. So I, c I will uh, also have transports like uh, UDP and probably other stuff, whatever makes sense. Bluetooth. Uh, how, 
How open is NoFlow? Because I heard there was a Kickstarter for it, so is there a closed component to it or something? I'll just say one thing. All the code that you saw here is open. It's on GitHub now. Yeah, so NoFlow, NoFlow is all MIT licensed, both the server side and the client side and the UI. And uh, mainly the uh, the license, what, what we talked about in the Kickstarter, is more for the convenience of not having to you know, install it yourself. So you will get it as a service. But you, if you want, you can just install everything on your own machinery and run it. So the hosted service will be FlowHub, which is. So any more questions? Come on, there's stickers. I have many. I, I can't. I don't know. Oh. Question two. Um, definitely worth kind of exploring the range of use cases that you see this being applicable for, because obviously there's, there's microcontroller, but are there any other, you mentioned video and audio processing type stuff, so that's definitely more of a desktop type application. I'm kind of interested in mobile applications as well. And so. Yeah, I mean, this was not a microcontroller. This was a microcontroller, an embedded Linux machine, or, well, my ordinary Linux machine, uh, but it could run a Raspberry Pi or router, and uh, browser. Those are the three platforms that we enable right now. So whatever you can do on your normal machine with Node.js, if you have a Node.js API for it, you can put that in trivially. Uh, places that with this would be natural. Um, the use cases that I see uh, and I focus on are um, home automation where the user might want to configure some things himself so that programming is not something that only the programmer does, uh, but there's a fluent um, kind of, uh, you can move between looking at the UI to tweaking a bit to hacking the system to really making that thing. Um, that's whole automation. The other thing is things like interactive art. I'm working with some Synchronize for that. So doing stuff that reacts on the environment, audio visuals, um, that react to physical sensors, um, that maps very nicely to data flow, usually. Um, and then there's more the traditional embedded type things, where you have a microcontroller that might control the power up or the boot up of your real embedded Linux system. And um, I'm working there on trying to get much better automated testing. So the runtime I said about running my computer, that allows me to write tests for the microcontroller program in JavaScript using Mocha. Everyone, please, a uh, big hand of applause for John. We actually have live video streaming of this whole thing. It's really awesome. Um, we have a five-minute break now, and then we'll have our next speech. Thank you very much.